Public opinion rarely sympathizes with a bully. President Herbert Hoover earned this image late July 1932 when General Douglas MacArthur led federal troops into a confrontation with demonstrators in Washington, D.C. MacArthur successfully routed out of the Capitol more than 11,000 unemployed veterans and their families by the use of tear gas and the threat of fixed bayonets, a New York Times journalist reported 24 hours after the incident. Hoover, in a public statement, declared, government cannot be coerced by mob rule. The veterans had arrived to Washington a few months before their violent expulsion. These former soldiers of the Great War organized a demonstration to persuade Congress to pay them immediately the compensation certificates the government vowed it would begin paying in 1945. The total owed by the U.S. government to veterans of the Great War was $2,400,000,000. In 1932, with the Great Depression in full swing, times were hard. These men had lost their jobs. Other work was unavailable and their families were living at below subsistence. The former soldiers expected some alleviation from their economic distress by collecting this money early. Hoover justified his rejection of immediate distribution of the funds by predicting it would further unbalance the budget. The proposal went before Congress. There, it was also opposed. After Congress made its decision, many of the veterans returned to their homes. Others remained in the Capitol, hoping that their persistent political activism would help change congressional minds. The presence of these demonstrators in the nation's capital embarrassed Hoover. When crowds resisted local authorities, riots erupted. Hoover then called in the United States Army. The president ordered General MacArthur that the veterans be contained on the Anacostia Flats across the Anacostia River on the periphery of the capital. MacArthur disregarded the executive order and forced the ex-soldiers immediately and totally to evacuate. In the street fighting that ensued, two veterans died and many were injured. A journalist reported that as the bonus army retreated from Washington, crowds of residents and tourists from the adjoining countryside sped them along with a cheer. The public honored the veterans as heroes whom the president had humiliated. Hoover never reprimanded MacArthur for refusing to follow orders. Instead, President Hoover assumed complete responsibility for the events. One of the main organizers of the bonus expeditionary army accused the president of instigating the violence. He telephoned the Washington Post, hours after riots subsided. Quote, every drop of blood shed or that may be shed in the days to come as a result of these events can be laid directly on the threshold of the White House. Many Americans refuse to forgive Hoover for his transgressions. General MacArthur had assumed that the march and occupation of Washington by veterans was a communist plot. He reasoned that behind the, quote, wishful waiting for the slightly more than $1,000 which was to be each man's share if Congress relented were communist conspirators who hoped to instigate violent confrontation between the veterans and the federal authorities. The end of this plot, according to MacArthur, would be a riot of such proportions that the U.S. Army would react aggressively and brutally against the former soldiers. The communists hoped to incite revolutionary action, explained MacArthur, to earn the title of hero and defender of the unemployed veterans. MacArthur's refusal to believe that the money the veterans sought would assist them in their economic woes demonstrated he did not consider seriously the financial stress of the veterans. His predictions 
that the communists among the veterans would successfully instigate a confrontation revealed his fear that financial distress of the veterans would increase their gullibility to communist manipulation. To view the Bonus Army as a patriotic organization formed by Walter W. Waters, a veteran of the Great War and the commander-in-chief of the Bonus Army, was difficult from the perspective of the general. Instead, his attention focused on the tiny band of communists and their ability to transform the movement. Communists participating in the demonstration perpetuated some of these suspicions. They tried to take credit for the organization of the Bonus Army. They did not deserve the credit. Communists had many opponents among the veterans who had worked hard to exile them from their ranks. Their inner political struggle within the Bonus Army increased the anxieties of Washington's authorities that street fighting would ensue. The fear of communism, that is, that Americans were gullible to communist infiltration and manipulation, resulted from insecurity among many U.S. leaders that financial stress put the political infrastructure of the nation at risk. It was not just the threat of communists, even though Americans had never stomached communism well. The crash of 1929 and the depression which followed increased Americans' openness to alternative political institutions. It perpetuated many to question the free market and individualism. Membership to the Communist Party of the USA, the CPUSA, did increase during the decade of the 1930s. And it was this fear among US leaders that American economic ways ceased to offer hope, which led many, like General MacArthur, to view the Washington occupation by the Bonus Army as a communist plot. In retrospect, the public's attraction to communism was never as absolute as assumed by many leaders. Below the surface, where a communist conspiracy could seem imminent, existed other ideas, other political and cultural American ways which made a communist plot unlikely. Many Americans conceived of individualism and private property as the process of changing and adapting to the demands of the new era. President Hoover, for example, expressed reluctance toward advocating a breed of individualism fueled by unrestrained and unintelligent self-interest alone. To substitute for the cutthroat policies of the frontier past, Hoover promoted instead a new spirit of cooperation. Hoover's reluctant individualism fit perfectly well with his Puritan ways. Hoover's religiosity was at the heart of why he ordered MacArthur to contain the veterans and not completely rout them out. His Puritanism, the idea that within the Christian collective if one individual sins, the entire group sins, similarly made him guilty for MacArthur's stubborn disregard for executive orders. U.S. economic ways were in a transitional phase from a free market for the rich to a free market where, according to Hoover's, campaign promise, there would be a chicken in every pot. Like a snake shedding its skin, Americans were irritable and anxious. They felt vulnerable to attack. This made them cautious about wild stories of communist plots. The fear of communism was also part of a revelation that much of the prosperity of the 1920s was superficial prosperity. The second cause of anxiety was as relevant to comprehending the paranoia of authorities and willingness to believe in mob gullibility. Below U.S. economic prosperity were other hidden dimensions which shed light into the causes of the economic crash and depression which followed. The wealth of the new era was real. Technology had advanced and so had the means to produce innovative goods efficiently. Not everyone had access to these consumer items and even less had access to them by paying cash lump sum. This made the wealth of the new era hard to calculate. American consumers experienced marvels like radios, vacuum cleaners, home air conditioners, automobiles, mass produced and sold during the 1920s, home refrigerators, pop-up toasters, hair dryers, dial telephones, automatic dishwashers, penicillin, and so many other goodies. Cities shine bright with electric lights. Its jazz reverberated around the world. 
This was cosmetic. Uncle Sam's social blemishes hid beneath the red lips and nails, the blush and the mascara. The new inventions enjoyed by urbanites trickled slowly into the countryside. There was much social inequality between the city and rural areas. Farmers throughout the 1920s faced hard times. Their money woes began immediately after the Great War when farmers were stuck with large surpluses. This led to a decline in the prices of agricultural goods. Cotton prices plummeted some 50% and corn some 30%. Many farmers also invested in new equipment like tractors during the war. Tractors were an innovative tool because they released some 30 million acres of land to be cultivated. This new land spelled more food for Americans and their allies. This investment in this new technology also meant that many farmers depended on prices remaining stable if not increasing. When the war ended and the prices of agricultural goods fell, many farmers failed to earn the capital to pay their debt. Throughout the 1920s, foreclosures in the countryside increased. While Hoover's Republican predecessors, Presidents Coolidge and Harding opposed reforms which would have helped farmers by allowing the U.S. government to purchase agricultural surplus, Hoover immediately, after taking his post, instituted the Agricultural Marketing Act in 1929. It allowed the government to buy surplus goods and keep them out of the market to maintain prices steady. Unfortunately, the crash that hit the U.S. a few months later would negate many of the advantages of this act. African Americans experienced a cultural renaissance during the 1920s as black poets, novelists, artists, and professionals increased pride and in being of African descent. Langston Hughes wrote, quote, I am a Negro and beautiful. This cultural awakening was a black urban phenomenon. It was cosmetic. The majority of African Americans remain tied to rural life. They were hit harder than poor white farmers by decreasing agricultural prices. Not only did many black farmers lose their farms, but they also faced problems competing for non-farming jobs like janitors, street cleaners, and domestic servants. Jim Crow in the South made it so that whites had first dibs on these jobs. By 1932, more than 50% of the black population in the South was unemployed. African-American communities also experienced larger infancy deaths and earlier mortality rates than other groups in the United States. In the cities, even though workers' wages increased, these wages increased at a slower rate than industrial output. Factory productivity increased by 55%, hourly wages by 2%, and the cost of consumer goods decreased by 3%. This meant that many workers either did not purchase these goods or did so by utilizing credit. The majority of the profits remain in the hands of the wealthiest when a larger share of it needed to trickle down to the average man to avoid mass public debt. In a technologically advanced society where real wages had not increased significantly, workers more than not opted still to enjoy the modern life. They bought today and paid tomorrow. Credit became fashionable and easy to have. In a popular novel of the 1920s titled Babbitt by Sinclair Lewis, the narrator describes the occupation of the protagonist, George F. Babbitt, who was a realtor and nimble in the calling of selling houses for more than people could afford to pay. Hoover was aware of the fragile base on which American business had built this prosperity during the 1920s. He criticized capitalists for their short-sightedness. He affirmed they endangered capitalism because they're so damn greedy. The point here is that for industrialists to continue earning profits, it was necessary that more people purchase their output by cash and not credit. Much of the money used to purchase modern goods was non-existent. Many working class Americans lacked the money to buy radios and refrigerators with cash. Retailers to increase profits and to keep up with industrial output provided installment plans to customers. Much of the mad consumption of the 1920s occurred on credit. These habits bled into the stock market. In the 1920s, 
Charles Mitchell, president of National City Bank, also introduced the American public to buying stocks, which represented shares of companies like Radio Corporation of America, also known as RCA, which was one of the most sold stocks during the decade. His publicity campaign inspired many common Americans to participate in the stock market. By the late 1920s, trading stocks became so fashionable that almost all popular magazines provided financial advice. Even astrologers partook in the mania as they predicted which stocks would gain and which lose. Like with consumer goods, if individuals lacked the funds to purchase stocks, banks allowed them to buy the stocks on the margin. A stock bought on the margin meant that an individual would pay only 10% of the worth and the bank would front the remainder. As long as stocks continued to climb, everyone won. The financial threat would only come if stock prices fell. At that point, the holder of the stock, who borrowed the money to purchase, had to front money to the bank to make up the difference. If the difference was not paid, then the bank would sell the stock and the original holder would lose his 10% down payment. This lending frenzy flowed out of the United States as well. Throughout the 1920s, loans to Southern American countries were granted in the hope that these nations used the money for productive purposes. Banks rarely provided monetary supervision. The outcome by the late 1920s and early 1930s was that these nations became debt-ridden and had to surrender their sovereignty to U.S. banks. The poverty caused by the debt also made these countries susceptible to political and social radicalism. Much of this social upheaval was directed at the elites which controlled the nations and the U.S. who supported these elites. It is not a coincidence that Latin American nations experience a number of peasant rebellions. One State Department advisor criticized, quote, the investment in banking houses because they were so untrained, it be said, unfit, it be said, for the task of guiding the flow of American capital abroad. Hoover agreed that many of the domestic problems faced by the U.S. during the early 1930s were a consequence of economic and political crises abroad. Hoover, however, had Europe on the mind. It was Europe that Hoover perceived as the biggest sore spot. During the Great War, the U.S. loaned money to France and Britain so that these nations could continue to purchase war supplies. At the end of the war, France and Britain passed the bill to Germany as punishment for their bellicosity. Although Americans like Woodrow Wilson and Herbert Hoover opposed German reparations, France and Britain were quick to point out that without the $33 billion forced on Germany, American banks would not see many loans repaid. During the 1920s, U.S. officials tried to lower Germany's debt. They contended debt would cripple Germany financially. During the 1920s, U.S. private banks continued to make loans to Germany, which the latter, Germany, used to pay France and Britain, and then France and Britain used to pay the U.S. Treasury. When the Great Depression went global, this merry-go-round flow of money stopped and further crippled U.S. banks and the economy. Hoover was conscious of some of the main problems internationally causing economic depression, but he did not himself help the situation. When he entered office, he passed the Haley-Smoot Tariff. It was intended to protect U.S. producers from foreign competition. When the Depression hit and U.S. producers sought foreign markets, many of these foreign markets imposed their own high tariffs in retaliation to U.S. economic nationalism. Thus, it became difficult for U.S. producers to sell their goods abroad when Americans lacked the funds to purchase them domestically. Leading to the election of Herbert Hoover, the United States existed on two dimensions. At present dimension, people appeared to be enjoying life in the U.S., Times were good. In a sub-present dimension, hidden from the excitement of advertisements and the buying frenzies, Americans had not paid in full for these luxuries. It was not that they did not work hard. Americans worked hard. Yet their hard work was not enough to live the modern life, so they abused credit. The American public had high expectations for Hoover when he assumed his post in the White House. A campaigner for Hoover asked a crowd of farmers, why do we want Hoover? Because he can solve problems, the campaigner responded. Many U.S. voters believed it. 
Hoover won the presidency by a landslide. He won 444 electoral votes, while his opponent, Al Smith, a wet and Catholic, won only 78. Hoover carried all the states except for seven, the majority located in the Deep South. Hoover was a humanitarian. In the aftermath of the Great War, he was a key figure in helping war-devastated Europe reorganize its economic infrastructure. In the early 1920s, even Franklin D. Roosevelt admired Hoover. FDR praised Hoover as, quote, certainly a wonder, and I wish we could make him president of the United States of America. There could not be a better one. Hoover did oppose government intervention, preferring a spirit of volunteerism. However, he also opposed a government which would stand on the sidelines while U.S. citizens confronted economic malady. Hoover wrote in his memoirs, he had intended to push the U.S. into a progressive direction. We want to see a nation, Hoover explained, built of homeowners and farm owners. We want to see their savings protected. We want to see them in steady jobs. We want to see more and more of them insured against death and accident, unemployed and old age. We want them all secure. Hoover in some ways was a new dealer before the New Deal. In 1929, before the crash, Americans expected Hoover would make miracles. One journalist reflected on the promise of Hoover's presidency. Quote, we were in a mood for magic. Mr. Hoover was inaugurated and the whole country was a vast expectant gallery, its eyes focused on Washington. We had summoned the great engineer to solve our problems for us. Now we sat back comfortably and confidently to watch the problems being solved. The modern technical mind was for the first time at the head of a government. Relieved and gratified, we turned over to that mind all the complications and difficulties no other had been able to settle." End quote. Hoover failed to remedy the problems faced by the United States when he became president. A combination of the public's high expectations and his failures blurred the progressive nature of Hoover's politics. But continuities, there were many in the political and ideological shift from Hoover to the new president, Franklin D. Roosevelt. By his successes and failure, Hoover provided a blueprint for the New Deal and his successor.